Okay. Um, okay. So, so thank you uh, again for for inviting me. Um, this is a, a useful forum for for discussing stochastic thermodynamics. It's nice to have uh, such a such a broad audience who, who are all experts in in stochastic thermodynamics. That's a it's a nice opportunity. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, energetic costs and in, in non-equilibrium control for for driven self-assembly. Um, but I'm going to touch on a number of things that I think are are closely related to, to the last talk and some of the discussion that was happening. Um, and so the the primary references are are listed here. Uh, two are papers from last year. Uh, two are are recently posted to the archive. So let me quickly uh, acknowledge my my research group. So um, the work that I'm going to talk about today is mostly work from uh, Jai Wei Yen and and my graduates in Sri Ram. Um, and then the, the rest of the group are working on a uh, diverse set of things, some, some related to stochastic thermodynamics, some totally unrelated. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with, uh, you know, a, a system that I think most of you know, and probably an experiment that many of you have seen, which is uh, this system of active Brownian particles, right? So these uh, are, uh, I think, a, a still uh, interminably fascinating system uh, that shows a sort of uh, distinctive pattern formation um, that is the result entirely of a non-equilibrium drive. So uh, without the light, of course, when you turn the, the light off, these systems uh, start to fall apart, which you'll see in just a second. And this is something that, you know, is experimentally realized through the use of these cleverly designed Janus particles that are coated on one side by platinum. So these are, you know, on the colloidal scale, not on the microscopic scale. Um, but it's still a, a relatively amazing thing. And of course, you know, the, this uh, type of experiment was uh, simultaneously pursued with a, a lot of work focused on uh, modeling very, very similar types of system, active Brownian particles, AOUPs, you know, all of these active matter papers were kind of simultaneous with, with these experimental developments. Uh, and that has led to, I think, a, a really rich exploration of the phase behavior of how we transform liquid state theory to, you know, capture the effects of active liquids. Um, and it's also, I think, inspired a lot of work about, uh, about non-equilibrium self-assembly. And one of the, you know, the central questions that uh, we need to, uh, to face when we think about self-assembly is self-assembly dynamics. Um, so, you know, when you talk to people working in, in biophysics, uh, despite the fact that much of biology is heavily using uh, non-equilibrium processes to dictate self-assembly, they still tend to think of, of self-assembly as a, as a purely thermodynamic problem. And the way that, you know, it is conceived of is primarily as a, a problem where, you know, you have a set of interactions that dictate the structure that will form. And, and they forget about the, the dynamics, even for an equilibrium self-assembly process mattering, right? Kinetic trapping and other effects that lead to off-pathway intermediates uh, can play a huge role in, in self-assembly. And so, uh, you know, it's... It's very, uh, it's very complicated to actually know what will form by solving, you know, the associated Langevin equation or whatever your dynamics is, uh, because the distribution that you actually sample through this dynamics could have metastability that leads to, you know, long-lived intermediate states that are very, very difficult to escape. So. If we wanted to, for example, design uh, self-assembly, if we wanted to target particular structures or particular properties of, uh, of physical systems by having them self-assemble in a particular way, then we have a few different options for control. I mean, there, there are more than two, but th these are the two that I'm gonna discuss. Um, so the, the two options for control are to either change the potential energy of the system, change V, to alter the equilibrium distribution, or if we assume that the system, you know, is in at least a steady state, uh, it doesn't need to be an equilibrium steady state, then we could alternatively use some sort of non-equilibrium control to try to drive the system towards a desired state. Uh, and that desired state could be something that is 
kinetically trapped over you know a significant duration or it could be something that uh you know is just uh you know uh, a particular steady state that we're trying to arrive at so this control could be continuous in time um and i'm going to assume throughout that this control uh has the form of a of a feedback control though it doesn't necessarily need to depend on the state of the system right so you can just have a u of t that is independent of the state and in many cases that that would be easier to implement right you wouldn't need to actually measure and respond you could just apply an external field that application of the external field could potentially drive you into a desired state so the question ultimately becomes how do you design that non-equilibrium control or design those interactions um so let, let me first just say that i'm, I'm not going to talk uh, about interaction design because uh, i think in in most cases it is too challenging for uh, chemistry and biophysics. So it has, you know, I mean, it certainly occurs in, in some biophysical systems and it has uh, uh, properties that are very desirable because it leads to, to uh, robust and complex assemblies much of the time. So uh, Will Jacobs at Princeton has done a, a lot of nice work on these sorts of problems. Um, the, the issue is that there are not so many systems that afford us the level of flexibility to design interactions arbitrarily. So uh, if you really want to create uh, you know, a system that has essentially a unique uh, assembly pathway, then you either need to constrain the structure so that essentially one thing is possible, right? So one thing can form, or you need to have such specific interactions, uh, sometimes called addressable interactions, that you can basically create no off pathway intermediates. Um, and that's sort of the, the regime on, on the left, right? So you have you know, these highly specific interactions uh, that lead to uh, pretty well-defined structures of significant complexity. Um, and of course, you know, the, the early uh, understanding of biophysical self-assembly, which was in the context of viruses, uh, looked at sort of geometrical constraints on the types of structures that could form based on uh, the arrangements of, of hexamers or pentamers and uh, of proteins that form a viral shell. Uh, and this was worked out in, in the 50s by, by Kasper and Klug, actually, over, over a summer break, they uh, were at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and sort of mapped out the, the possible structures that could form with different numbers of components but the components themselves in, in small, simple viruses are typically quite geometrically constrained. And so as a result, you don't really end up with uh, many off pathway intermediates forming. So uh, this, you know, this is something that in principle can be engineered for some systems. But if we want to you know, look at the scale of, uh, say, hundreds of proteins, uh, then, you know, these, these types of tasks become unfeasible because those proteins will typically interact weakly and non-specifically, and that leads to uh, the invariable um, kin kinetic trapping. And so, you know, if you can't, uh, if you can't avoid kinetic trapping, then you have no option really for uh, interaction design. So I, I'm going to reformulate the problem a little bit just as a control problem, um, but you know, acknowledging the fact that uh, uh, you know we we again do not have the level of specificity that could be required to make an arbitrary state. So in general, the the types of external parameters that we could feasibly control are relatively coarse. They're things like temperature, like external fields. Uh, and so, you know, we're not going to be able to engineer an arbitrary state. If we engineer an arbitrary state, we're kind of back to the interaction design paradigm. Um, so the generic problem could be formulated as follows, right? So you, you could say, I have some steady state distribution that uh, I start in, and I want to find a control protocol, uh, U sub T, that is going to map my distribution to a target distribution for every point in my domain. So that problem, you know, is a, a relatively well-studied type of problem. It's an optimal transport problem, um, but it requires a, a lot of flexibility. In, um, and so, so a weaker version of this, uh, and one that in principle could be measured in an experimental context or in, you know, a, uh, even in a simulation, 
uh, is to try to specify this uh, desire in terms of an observable F. So anytime that we need knowledge of a high dimensional distribution, it's basically a non-starter. If you require knowledge of a high dimensional distribution, then you know, you've already put yourself in a, a regime that's somewhat hopeless because uh, if you have, for example, an interacting particle system, there, there's really no way of specifying the distribution in high dimensions unless the system is completely trivial. So what we need to do is make a measurement um, and we do that through some observable F. And so what I'm gonna define as the, the desired protocol is something relatively simple, which is that it's the protocol such that the non-equilibrium average under the protocol of my observable F is as close as possible, just measured through absolute value to some target value F star. Okay, so that's gonna define for me U star. So this is a simple thing. I just want the average of F to be as close as possible to some target. So if, if we allow F to range over all possible values, then this uh, connects back to this notion of optimal transport. So this is actually kind of a, the, the problem that I'm describing is a relaxation of the optimal transport problem. So if we maximize over all F, uh, I mean, it's a, a supremum, uh, then, we get an integral probability metric, which is the Wasserstein one metric between the controlled distribution and, uh, and the target. And these integral probability metrics uh, are, are very mathematically well-studied um, uh, objects. And you know, the, the connection to minimum dissipation, uh, which it was, there was some discussion in the chat in the last talk about this, uh, is, is well known. So, I mean, it was originally established by Brenier and Benamou and, and Villani. Uh, Eric Oral in 2011 has a very nice paper where he sort of translated a lot of this into the language of, of stochastic thermodynamics. Um, what's, what's sort of nice about this and what's discussed about it is in uh, this paper here, um, which is a, a recent paper of ours, um, is that you can, uh, you can actually show that um, the optimal transport uh, maps lead to finite time realizations of protocols that minimize dissipation. So, you know, one of the challenges with the optimal transport formulation is that when you attempt to use it, uh, you have a problem that is in the full space of probability distributions yet again, but ultimately what we care about is designing protocols. And so you need to translate the optimal transport problem into a protocol problem uh, that's what that's what this paper does. So it, it gives you a kind of practical guide to um, translating the optimal transport distance into an optimization target for a protocol, which is, you know, doesn't have full control over the distribution. Um, and just to, to kind of show you, you know, what the results look like. So if you take one of these sort of very simple systems, uh, so we look at this system and a, a, a simple uh, open quantum system, um, what you see is that, you know, there's a clear correspondence between uh, W2 and the dissipation, uh, and also that this outperforms the linear response uh, protocols in the fast driving limit, which is, you know, exactly what you would expect. So this is um, uh, a kind of, you know, simple modification of this connection between optimal transport and dissipation. Uh, and this is just to say, you know, that this connection is, is real, right? So there's there's a connection between dissipation and, and optimal transport. Um, and if you drive very, very slowly, then you recover these notions of thermodynamic metrics that are related to the Fisher information and Kramer Rao. Um, so this is kind of a, a finite time generalization of it. So, okay, so so now we, we still have this problem of solving an optimal control problem for, uh, for this self-assembly task. Um, so, one option is to define the observable, the target observable, in terms of a dynamical observable. And so, you know, this is, uh, this slide is uh, here just as a, a guide. I mean, I'll post these slides afterwards, so I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail because I think most of you are very well familiar with the, the large deviation formula, formalism because uh, it's used so heavily in stochastic thermodynamics, but this is just to say you know, one, one thing that we could try to do is control a dynamical observable. 
Uh, and if we do that, then you know we need to solve a, a large deviations problem and connect that dynamical observable to uh, you know whatever structure that we're trying to form through the self assembly. So um, just to to say how how we do this at a very high level. Uh, so we formulate this calculation as an as an optimal control problem, uh, which you know uses the optimal the variational formulation of large deviations. It's originally due to Wang and Dupuy uh, from from a long time ago, um, and this uh, approach represents the control force as, as a neural network. So this is you know in principle not necessarily an implementable force. It's a many body force. Uh, and then we backpropagate through through time. So we use uh, something that's like an adjoint method to do this optimization and just to, to show you that, that this works on the, for a simple cumulant generating function. As we do this optimization, you see that uh, we recover the, uh, the scaled cumulant gener generating function at, at all values of lambda. So this is uh, a nice little algorithm for these calculations. But what's what's really nice about it is that you can scale it up to very large systems by using uh, you know modern machine learning techniques. So we use these things that are called graph neural networks, which basically parameterize a, a kind of local interaction through a very flexible formalism. Um, I again will we'll not talk about this in a ton of detail given the the amount of time. But this is just to say that we, you know, we choose a kind of uh, rotationally and permutationally and translationally invariant map uh, that is sufficiently flexible that we can represent an arbitrary set of forces. These are, are parametric and we do a parameter optimization so that we solve this optimal control problem associated with uh, the, the Wang and Dupuy formulation of large deviations. And that allows us to compute uh, uh, observables over large ranges and find these control forces, which you know are, are would be difficult to implement, but are in principle implementable. Um, and those connect uh, the dissipation or the dynamical observable of interest to uh, to structure in active phase transitions. And so, just to see the effect of this control force on a system of active Brownian particles, you see the sort of uh, assembly dynamics in some sense, right, through um, through the controlled system. So this is controlled in, in the low dissipation regime so that you see this kind of uh, well-defined structure formation. So uh, that's, that's kind of one paradigm for doing this, but the other that's a, a, maybe a little bit more along the implementable direction is to, to try to formulate this as a, as a pure control problem where we have much less insight into uh, you know, the, the actual interactions between particles. So if we carry out uh, such, a, such an optimization, um, it, it becomes substantially more complicated because uh, you know, the, there's not as uh, a well-defined variational principle in the same way. And we, we need to use uh, slightly heavier machinery to do these types of optimizations. So the system here that we have is, you know, again, an active Brownian particle system, but um, now we're going to ask for a slightly different result, which is basically to, to control the distribution of cluster sizes. So imagine that, you know, I, I specify for, for whatever reason that I want a, a distribution of, uh, of clusters that have on average 20 particles with a small variance, right? So I, I want, you know, a distribution of clusters throughout my system that's, that's very narrowly peaked at around 20. Um, so what we're going to imagine that, that we can do, and actually there's some, some work, experimental work happening currently to, to try to do exactly this, uh, is to uh, modulate the, the magnitude of the active force by controlling the intensity of light over a spatial grid. So, you know, we have uh, our system, which in, in the real systems are, are 2D, um, and we're going to spatially pattern the light with a, a feedback protocol that makes a, a local measurement and then applies light uh, some duration later. So this is actually a very natural setting for uh, reinforcement learning. And the idea of, of reinforcement learning is um, basically to, to learn how to act, right? So you, you look at a given state of the system and you, you know, make a measurement and then 
uh, you use that measurement to make a decision. Um, and so this, uh, in this context, basically what we're doing is we're, you know, we're defining some expectation of, of our future reward, where our reward is measured by how close are we to, to our target. Uh, and then we estimate this expectation through a function that we parameterize as, again, as a, as a neural network. Um, and this allows us to, you know, then choose uh, an action through a maximization problem. So we, we choose the action that tells us that we're going to observe the, the highest future reward. Okay, so the action set is, is relatively simple. It's, it's a somewhat high dimensional thing, but uh, it's basically just uh, going to, to allow us to, uh, to set the, the light. And sorry, was that I have five minutes? Sorry, you have no time. I have no Can, time. Okay, yeah. okay. So then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, so let me just show you how, how this works. Uh, uh, so this is with low resolution. You see this curve, which shows that the average is is bad. So we're not we're not doing very well. The, the variance is still large. Um, and so again, this is the optimization where my observable is just a, a discrepancy between the the instantaneous distribution and my my target distribution of states. Um, if we do a higher resolution, though, then then we actually observe uh, basically the the target exactly, which is shown here. So this is uh, very very close to the target distribution, and this is just showing that you you can do this. Um, and of course, you know this can all be connected back to the the cost of control through the Wasserstein distance. Uh, and so you can actually see uh, a linear correspondence between uh, the dissipation and in, in the system uh, and the fidelity of the of the control. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for, for your attention and, and uh, for having me.